Pearson, Dr. Robert Stubblefield. I'm Steve Richens, and this show is sponsored by the Ayn Rand Center UK. Please like, subscribe, and send us some super chats. The title of today's show is Creatical Thought Experiments. The subtitle is Challenging Assumptions That Make Bad Critical Thinking and Break Good Creative Thinking. Now, Lee's been working on this uh, methodology for a while, and so I'm going to turn it over to him. He's going to present uh, today. Lee. Now, when you say a, a while, it's actually a long while, as will become clear in a moment. But I like that, Steve, that with your introduction, you are on the critical edge. Uh, cre uh, sorry, on the cutting, the cutting edge. edge. Yeah. You are. That's very good. That's very good. Okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, a couple episodes ago, we started talking about uh, key concept thinking which is, uh, in, uh, in my view, is a fundamental method of thinking skill training. We started talking about that, and we will talk about it more in the future, particularly with respect to issues of comprehension, because I hope we're going to get some, we'll find some articles and things to, to analyze uh, the key concepts of. And we started doing that a little bit last time with uh, some key concepts in perception theory. Uh, but today we're going to, to zero in, narrow in, on this episode, uh, zero in on one very important form of knowledge activation about key, about key concepts, because knowledge activation is very important, activating the right knowledge. Uh, knowledge is both the product and the fuel of thinking, and you have to activate the right knowledge to keep your thinking going. And what we're gonna talk about this, this uh, episode is a particular, I think, interesting form of systematic activation of knowledge by imagination, by using imagination. Uh, and I use the term creatical for this uh, because um, I believe this thought process, this kind of thought process underlies both creative and critical thinking or critical and creative thinking to what direction. Let's go creative and critical so we get creatical out of that. And um, I'll tell you about, well, let's, I might as well tell you now that uh, I, I thought of this word, uh, this neologism, I suppose, uh, some years ago. But then, of course, I went to the internet and found, much to my dismay, that some time earlier, I think it was about 1990, some fellow um, already created the word creatical and had written a book, in fact, wrote a book called Thinking Creatically. So you can imagine how my crest was fallen when I discovered this fact. But eh, it's not the end of the world. I mean, there are many reasons why it doesn't matter that much. The fellow uh, uh, is not alive anymore. Sorry to say. Um, I don't think the book's in print anymore. But more importantly than that, uh, this he was uh, the book was printed by the Institute for General Semantics, and this guy was a general semanticist. And I'm sure some of you know what that is. Uh, they're the followers of Count Korzybski, the Polish count. And I think, near as I can tell, the main tenet of of um, general semantics is things are not what they are. A is not A. In fact, there was a science fiction writer who wrote about. General Semantics, A.E. Van Vogt, who wrote a, uh, one book was called The World of Null A, where things, things aren't what they are. So uh, I'm not too worried. It's a totally different usage of the term. So I'm going to continue to use this word creatical for this purpose. Uh, now, let me tell you what got me thinking about this. The idea, actually, I thought of long before I thought of the word, years ago, this is actually in the 80s, I think. I know many of you cannot even imagine such an era, but I'm, this was back in the 80s. I was doing some work for Encyclopedia Britannica as a consultant. They had a, in those days, they had some um, learning centers across the country or various places across the country. And I was doing for, work for them. And uh, at some point in the process, the guy I was working with at Britannica uh, brought up that, that, uh, that they had obtained or bought into uh, a speed reading course, actually the most famous speed reading course. But anyway, they had the speed reading course and there was a test that the speed reading course used to 
to um, assess the progress of the speed readers. Now, I told the fellows we were talking, I said, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical about speed reading. I don't think speed reading in general is a good idea. That, uh, that um, what you need to do is um, modulate your reading speeds depending on material, but it's almost the opposite of what you want to do. And in, in many cases, slower is faster in a lot of forms of cognition and particularly comprehension. So I expressed this to him. He said, well, okay, why don't we use you to evaluate the test? So they, they sent me the test, uh, the speed reading test. It was based on a fairly low level biography of Einstein, of Albert Einstein, uh, you know, his life. And uh, to get to the court, cut to the chase here, a uh, cu couple of the questions. One of the questions was something like, when, when little Albert, because they called him little Albert in this book, when little Albert was sitting there playing the piano, no, I'm sorry, when little Albert's mother was sitting playing the piano, what was little Albert sitting on himself? And they had answers like it was multiple choice, as like stool, chair, sofa, those kinds of answers. Well, that was one question. Another question was something like this. Again, I'm not being precise here, but uh, was I, my memory will be good enough. Uh, with, uh, the question was when, when little Albert's uncle, Uncle Max, Uncle something, when his uncle came to visit the Einstein household, what did the uncle and little Albert talk about? You know, A, baseball, B, politics, C, geometry, and maybe some others. Well, you know, they talked about geometry, of course. So what was my comment on these questions? I, I thought it was obvious. It was obvious. The first question, I'd almost be willing to give negative credit for because it's such an inessential fact. Who cares? What difference does it make to anything? What little Albert was sitting on? You know, it just doesn't matter. Uh, uh, on the second question, however, that could easily matter because if the uncle had talked about politics instead of geometry, who knows what that could have done and how that would have changed the history of, of physics, you know, possibly. So that was important. And I thought it was obvious, but it, it got me to thinking, I told them, you know, this, this is obvious, got me to think about how do you really know that that's true? I mean, you sure it's a intuitive, instantly intuitively obvious, you might say, but how do you, how do you nail that down? So in thinking about that a little bit, it occurred to me that the thought process that you could use here involves looking at the range of possible answers to the question and seeing what difference does it make, what answer possibly could be given. So you ask yourself something like, what if Einstein had been sitting on a chair? What if he'd been sitting on a, on a stool? What if he'd been sitting on a sofa? What difference would it make to anything that we are concerned with here for our purposes? What difference is, this is what I call the what if, what diff principle. What if we have this, this or that? What difference would it make to whatever we care about? No difference, therefore, not a good question. Okay, and the other question, what if they what if they've been talking about um, uh, baseball? <laughs> well, as baseball wasn't too big in those days, but we're certainly not in Germany. But anyway, what if they've been talking about politics or something instead of geometry? What difference would that make? Might have made a difference. I'm not certain, but might well have. That question has some importance. So that's the process that I'm going to call creatical variation, variation of uh, that, that you can use on, in various contexts. Here, the context is to determine uh, whether a question is a good question or not. I mean, you can think about this in terms of assumptions. Uh, can we assume or not that this is a question that is focused on essentials? And it turns out in one case, yes, and in another case, no. Just okay, so let me, yes, uh, yeah, Bob. You, you said your method is what if, what diff, Yes, that's just a little short yeah. shorthand. You know, what if you vary uh, th this element? What difference does it make to whatever you care about? So it's a little shorthand for that. What if, what if? Um, okay, so then let's look at, uh, before I go on to some um, other uses that I've made or would suggest, let's take a look at Ayn Rand's use of this process. She doesn't call it that name. She doesn't call it any name, but uh, in, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, she actually uses this process to determine, uh, to, uh, to identify what is a fundamental in a conceptual, uh, with respect to a certain concept. In other words, this is how you identify how to define, what to select as a defining characteristic. And I believe Steve has this, I hope. 
has a, a picture we can put up. You want to try that, Steve? Sure. Yeah. Let me Let's see if it. Uh... It's disabled. <laughs> disabled. Ah. Well, yeah. You, uh, Irene has to enable me. Our producer, oh, Irene. Irene. Hello, Irene. Is Irene there? Yep. You should be co-host now. Okay. You are now abled. You're you're an abled person, not a disabled person. There it is. Okay. Ah, there it is. So I'm going to go ahead and read this, uh, but I guess everybody can see this. Metaphysically, a fundamental. Oh, this is coming from. By the way, this is coming from Introduction to Objective Epistemology. It's from the chapter on definitions, I believe. So Ayn Rand says, metaphysically, a fundamental characteristic is that distinctive characteristic which makes the greatest number of others possible. Epistemologically, it's the one that explains the greatest number of others. For instance, now here we get into the thought experiment. For instance, one could observe that man is the only animal who speaks English, wears wristwatches, flies airplanes, manufactures lipstick, studies geometry. Oh, well, there's Einstein again studying geometry, studies geometry, reads newspaper, writes poems, darns socks, etc. So there are many, many characteristics that apply to man. None of these is an essential characteristic, she says. None of them explains the others. None of them applies to all men. Now we get to the thought experiment. Omit any or all of them. Assume a man who has never done any of these things. Imagine this, you see. And he will still be a man. So you can you can do, uh, I'm going to call this mental subtraction. You can take the thing out of the picture altogether. And the, you know, in this case, the point is the man is still a man. So uh, you can't assume that any of these things are necessary to being a, a man. That is to say to being a human. Let's to be clear about that. Then, he, then she says, but observe that all these activities and innumerable others require a conceptual grasp of, of reality, that an animal would not be able to understand them, that they are the expressions and consequences of man's rational faculty. And here's the thought experiment part again, that an organism without that faculty would not be a man. Imagine that you didn't have that, you'd be missing all these things that are all these fundamental properties. And you will know why man's rational faculty is essential distinguishing and, and defining characteristics. So here's a, a, a mental, process of variation, uh, mental subtraction in this case, that enables you to identify what's fundamental to separate what's fundamental from what isn't. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead here. Uh, so it's, it's what I'm talking about is a kind of thought experiment. Uh, you know, that thought, exper thought experiments have a long history. They go back to the Greeks. Uh, probably the most famous thought experimenter historically, well, there are two of them. Galileo and Einstein are two, two very famous ones. So there's a history here. Um, and I'm going to apply the, this idea of systematically varying things in imagination to uh, two contexts today, which critical reasoning, which we're going to do briefly. And I'm going to spend a little more time on creative thinking. We'll probably come back to the critical reasoning at a later date, other, other shows, because I think we're gonna be taking up some topics that we wanna do critical analysis. I hope we can find some, we, we will in the future. So I'll just uh, touch on that today and then spend a little more time on the creative aspect. Okay, so let's point four here. Well, there's something a little bit wrong with my note pages. I don't know why. All right. So um, let's go ahead with um, Steve, if you have the slide with the, sh with the one uh, with about musical compositions. Musical compositions uh, uh, constitute a language because they are expressive. I believe that's what it says.
There it is. Okay. So this is uh, a very, very short logical argument. That is to say, uh, it's trying to convince you, of the, uh, it arrives at a conclusion that it's trying to convince you is correct. Now, again, we will probably uh, do some uh, more extensive analysis of the issues here at a later date. But I will just say, first of all, that when you have, a, uh, to give something here, that when you have an argument that arrives at some conclusion by giving some evidence, it's a good idea to try to analyze what the assumptions are. And one way to do that, that I will use here that's pretty obvious in this case, is you try to separate or you separate in your mind the evidence part and the conclusion part. Of course, many ar some arguments have sub sub arguments as well as the uh, overall argument. I'm not going to worry about that now, but your basic argument separated into evidence conclusion. And then um, look for something, look for what I would call a conceptual substitution in the conclusion. And then you can go back to the evidence and find what it was substituted for. Let me explain here what, what I mean by that. In this case, for example, um, the, uh, there's a key concept that enables you to separate evidence conclusion in this one. And that's the word because, the concept of because. Because because, what follows because, because is some kind of evidence, may or may not be evidence for the overall main conclusion. In this argument, it is. So we have evidence it's that uh, they are expressive. And they, of course, is a pronoun that refers to musical compositions. So that's the evidence. So what's the conclusion? Well, that's the other part that says musical compositions constitute a language. Okay, so now I've got those two parts. The, the uh, conclusion is musical constitutes, uh, compositions constitute a language. The evidence is because musical con um, compositions are expressive. And I want to look at the difference. I want to look what, what has been substituted into the conclusion and focus on that to identify an assumption. In this case, it's the word expressive is in the conclusion. It's there, it's not in the evidence. So we've got something new. There's some kind of connection being made there via an assumption. Well, we can identify that assumption by going back to the evidence and looking for what was expressive substituted for something that it, uh, it substituted for something that is connected to it logically in the argument. Uh, connections are generally things either uh, causal or categorical are the really common. If uh, There may not be any others, I'm not sure, but those are two categories of connection, causal, categorical. So we have expressive here. What concept does that substitute for? Language. Musical constitution uh, constant language because musical constitution compositions are expressive. Expressive was substituted in for language. Therefore, the assumption is that there is some kind of sufficient connection between language and expressive. You could express it this way. If something is expressive, it is a, a language. Yeah, if something's expressive. And in fact, uh, if this were a test question, like on the law school test, for example, that would be, and they ask what should the following is assumed by the argument, it is very likely that the answer would be in the form of something like uh, very close to, if something is expressive, it is therefore a language. Okay, so that's just briefly how you analyze assumptions. We will uh, tackle that subject uh, at greater length some other time. What's more, uh, you, well, I guess we could, could, you could keep it there for a second, Steve, because I want I, I, just so we keep it in mind. Um, All right. What I want to analyze now is how do you know whether that's a good assumption or not? How do you think about how good an assumption it is? Well, you use variation, create a, very creatively. On, uh, you look at the conclusion. Well, uh, uh, which way are we doing it here? Let's see. You, you look and think, ask yourself, um, are there expressive, are there things that are expressive other than language, other than languages? Are there other expressive things? Because if there are, the assumption is not valid. The assumption doesn't work. And arguably, there are many things that are expressive that aren't language. Dance is expressive. Um, 
hand movements are expressive. Somebody might argue that the, well, anyway, there, there, are, there are many things you could bring up that, that brings up further arguments, but that's the line of thinking that you should go to analyze whether or not this is a good assumption. And so I would say, no, it's not a particularly good assumption because there are other forms, there are other things, other forms of expression. There are other forms of expression other than language. I guess that's the right way to put it. Okay, so that's just a, a taste of how you would use creatical variation to analyze whether assumptions are good in a logical argument or in a um, any kind of comprehension situation. Written comprehension, uh, comprehending a lecture, the same thing I always, li I'm listening, when I listen to a lecture, I'm listening for these key uh, concepts like expressive, and then try to analyze uh, uh, how they function in assumptions. And then by variation, think about whether the assumptions are good or not, good or not. And then I have a, then I have a good question to ask the lecturer, which I almost always do have some, some kind of question to ask. Okay, so let's move on from there. Let's go ahead to, what do we have next up, uh, Steve? Is it, did I say the, um, the, the cheese, is that next? Yes, that would be, that's what. Okay, so let's, let's that. So we're gonna talk about uh, creative thinking and the use of Variation, mental variation, creatical variation. To to uh, don't no, don't show that one. Don't show that one. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, get, get rid of that one quick. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Ah, geez. Now, now you've done it. Can we can we keep him on the cutting edge after he did that? Bob? I don't I don't know. We'll have to talk about that later. But all right, give us the other. Uh, give us let the me just go back, uh, Lee. And, yeah. Uh, okay. And. Uh, emphasize what you were saying with the last example. Good. And that is that Good. You're, using, you're using your imagination to come up with a variation. Yes. Uh, good. That's right. And uh, it, uh, if you think about Ayn Rand's case with the, with the uh, definition, uh, you, uh, one way of looking at it is it's something like, or maybe it is more than something like, an inverse operation to measurement omission. In this uh, imagination process, you are specifying measurements to see whether or not they make a difference. Measurement omission, you are despecifying, omitting the measurements that you know that, that you know don't matter, that you found out by some process, by this process, that don't matter. So they're they're uh, I don't know if the inverse operation is the, exactly the right term to use mathematically, but they're complementary. Anyway, they're, they're uh, almost the opposite uh, process. So uh, another point that could be made is that uh, when you want to avoid rationalization, when you want to know that you really know what you're talking about, it's very useful to have a variety of concretes. Yes, a variety, the, the key word there being variety, you know, over, over some range is uh, particularly good. That's that's a good point. That's good. Okay. And and Lee, uh, yes, um, Steve? yeah. Along along the lines of variation, you're challenging implicit premises. Key key concepts can be implicit, so they're not always on the sur surface of the argument. That's true. So what normally. Uh, happens there. I, I don't know. I'm talking a little off the top of my head. You make this, the, the point you make is a good point. Um, what normally happens there is you start off with some concepts that you have explicit, and those lead to other ones that will come up, or that you'll find in, in activating knowledge. That, you know that that also require examination. So the process is is open ended. It's not uh, limited to just the particular concepts that happen to be on the, on that page. They're presented on the page, so that that's absolutely true. Yeah, because oh. the default yep. is is concrete bound, and it was for me because when you were saying key concepts, <laughs> I was looking, you know, concretely, and they're implicated sometimes, and that made a lot of sense to me. Yeah, that's true. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so now, why, now let's put. That's the, why I like to say that you can find. Um, implicit subconscious 
to use a word that Bob loves, premises by introspection, which seems a paradox because we, we talked about this a little bit, I think, a few times ago. That seems a paradox because par introspection is what, of, what do you introspect? Consciousness. But there are indicators in consciousness that indicate the things that it, are subconscious that you're not conscious of. So you can move to those things. Yeah, you can move from uh, you know, what's, what's on the page or what's in your awareness at the moment. You can bring up other stuff and analyze that other stuff. Absolutely. And, that, and that's necessary frequently. Shall we try this time? <laughs> the, the chi, there we go. That's the chi. So that is a, what they call a wheel of cheese. A cylinder. Let, let us assume, by the way, for this purpose, even though it doesn't look this way, let's assume that this um, cylinder, this wheel of cheese is a perfect cylinder, mathematically. I don't want to have to worry about it. You can see that it kind of dips, dips in a little bit at the top. And I don't know what kind of cheese this is. It looks pretty old, but that doesn't matter. Imagine it's uh, cheddar cheese or imagine it's mozzarella. Probably not either of those the way that is. It doesn't matter what it is for our purposes. So some kind of cheese. The question is simply about it. And when you have a wheel of cheese, a cylinder, what is the minimal smallest number of straight cuts, straight cuts required to cut that cheese into eight equal sized pieces? I'll even throw in equal shaped pieces because that would also be true, but mainly equal size. What is the minimum number of cuts? Now, the sucker answer, the answer that pops into mind for many of us automatically without really thinking, that is without activating more knowledge, without, without looking at the, the, the variety of, of examples, you know, variation, uh, the, the relevant variation, without doing that, the answer that pops into one's head automatically is, is four, or in my head anyway. Uh, that is to say, if you took a knife and uh, from the top went one, I'm doing this <laughs> with my hand. I and I, I'm not even showing on the screen anymore. But if you just cut from the top, you cut one, two, three, four cuts from the top, and you'll get the eight equal pieces, like you would with a uh, birthday cake. By the way, you know, cut from the top, and if you cut four times, you get um, the eight equal pieces. But that's not the minimal number. And you know, maybe the the right way of doing it will just pop into your head. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't just pop into your head, you can get at it by variation, by creatical variation. Think about what can vary in this problem. And what's important in this problem, but let's see, what's important is cutting. So how, what can I vary about the cuts? Well, if you play around with that in imagination for a while, you may come across the fact that the cuts don't all have to end up being, how should I put this? It's sort of like, in the same plane from the top, all from the top, that maybe that's a good way. They, they don't all have to be from the top. And once you realize that and start playing around, you realize, and now Steve, <laughs> let's, let's, go, let's go to the second slide. Thank you very much. Uh, you'll see what you can do here, which is to say you do one cut at the top, two cuts at the top, getting four, and then do one slice right through the middle and get your, your eight pieces. So that's a you know, somewhat creative solution because it goes, it goes beyond what pops into some people's minds automatically and you get at it by variation. Uh, by the way, when I originally saw this problem somewhere, it was a cake, but I changed it from a cake because if you do this with a cake, like a birthday cake, some people are gonna get cheated on frosting. So I didn't think it was right quite to do it this way, you know, because the, guy, the guys in the bottom don't get as much frosting as the guys in the top. But it turns out, uh, by the way, however, um, it, there is a way of doing the same thing, a different way, in which the people won't get cheated on frosting. Any idea how you do that? This is a different kind of variation. What else? It's a layered, uh, if it's a la layered cake, then you don't have to worry about the frost. I mean, if frosting and- Oh, is this frosting kind of in the middle? That the same, yeah. it has the same frosting? I was thinking, that, no, that would not normally. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. They have a, they, but the frosting in there isn't the same kind of, usually 
we're getting really fine in distinctions here, but the frosting there isn't usually the same as the stuff, the stuff on the top. But what I was thinking was, well, here's what you, else you can do. What else can you vary? What can you vary in the situation? Here are questions, good questions to ask yourself when you're not sure you know, what to do in, in a thought process. Uh, you have a problem you're trying to solve. What else can vary or what else can I vary in the problem? What can vary? What else can vary? And what if I vary it? What difference does it make? Those are two questions to ask to generate these, um, uh, this imagine, an ag- imagination process. Well, I'm having a little trouble getting out my words today. I need to take another sip of, there we go, of uh, Coke Zero. Okay. So um, oh, here's the other, here's another way, though, another way you could do it that would uh, avoid the frosting problem. What else can vary? You can vary the positions of slices as you go along. If you um, cut the two cuts from the top first, and now you've got four pieces, and then take the four pieces and stack them, I guess you better be careful about that with a cake, it'd be tr- tricky. But anyway, if you stack them and then make one other cut right down the middle of your stack, you get eight pieces. And there's no, um, they're all equivalent in terms of frosting in that case. So that just shows it's sometimes there's more than one solution to these things. There's more than one way to vary things to get an answer. And that's worth keeping in mind. Okay. Uh, anything else about that, uh, Steve? I think. Um, well, you could say that the what uh, what the impl- implicit assumption or the bias in the thinking before yeah. you had this chart, because this was yeah. correct for me, is the uh, c- cutting it horizontally. Because the the concrete way to think about it is uh, ver- vertically. Vertical cuts, and so the implicit bias is: well, uh, yeah. I could I could cut it horizontally, and so that's that's the variation. Yeah, that's, that's correct. That's the ver- that no, that's the variation, and it's I'm, so I'm from what you said, I'm thinking maybe uh, one of the reasons that, that that's um, that the sucker answer uh, pops up is that we're used to cutting cakes. And what you do in cakes is you would you wouldn't do this with a cake, uh, precisely. I think because you, people would uh, get cheated on the frosting, or you know, get it's at least it's different. It's different, so we don't do it with cakes. And people are used to cutting cakes, and that gets automatized. And uh, creatical variation is a way of de-automatizing, a temporary de-automatization, shall we say? Okay, let's. Can we go on? Is the next thing the stuck truck? Is that next? What's the next thing? To, uh, yes. Say? Yes. Let's, That's what I let's remember. Let's have a look at the stuck truck. Now, I brought up the stuck truck before at some, but it was not recently. So there may be some of you out there that have heard about the stuck truck, but probably not. Or, uh, of course, it's a, it's a, it is somewhat well known, but there's a stuck truck. There's this guy with his budget rent a truck, and, he, uh, and the clearance there, it says it's 11 feet, 4 inches, I guess, or something like that. And the truck is somewhat higher than that. So it goes into the bridge and it gets stuck. And I don't know why that guy's car is parked there. But anyway, the truck is stuck. Now, uh, when I saw this, I saw this in some kind of puzzle book or something that was in the Lincoln Tunnel. Or some, I think, yeah, it was actually, I think it was the Lincoln Tunnel where this was, um, rather than a bridge. But it turns out that I have actually experienced this myself. Not that I was in the truck but I was very nearby when it happened. So let me use the actual instance that I went through myself um, as the example. I was driving home from teaching a class in New Jersey where I used to teach. And home for me was at that time was Manhattan. I have escaped since then from Manhattan, but I lived in Manhattan. And where I lived was a, a complex that had a parking structure underneath it. Underneath the complex was the parking structure, and there was one entrance to the parking structure with a, you know, wasn't extremely high. The, the, there was an overhang, a cement, concrete overhang that was not extremely high. So I, I came driving, coming in there, and I was about to turn into the entrance when I saw that there was a budget, not a budget, a um, U-Haul, <laughs> 
truck, but the same kind of thing, a little smaller than this one, actually, stuck the stuck truck. The truck was stuck in the entrance way. Now, I'd like to say that I got out and thought for a while and figured this out myself, but the fact is I had already figured out this problem long before. So it was really just for me a matter of memory, but I did work it out originally. I did work it out, but that was <laughs> before. This time I just had to use my memory. So I got out of my car, started walking over. Meanwhile, other cars are backing up behind, you know, when people are getting anxious, there's a big, big guy, looks like a football player coming out of one of the cars and he looks somewhat angry. I see, I see trouble ahead, but I walked over to the fellow who was stuck in his stuck truck. He got out and he said, I've been driving for four and a half hours from Boston. All I want to do is get this thing in the parking lot and go to sleep. You know, he went and he's, you know, uh, and so, well, I, I managed to tell him what to do. And I imagine many of you out there in YouTube land know what to do, probably know what to do here. But if you don't, let's talk, or even if you don't, even if you do, let's talk about the thought process a little bit. Um, so what's the, what are the conceptual elements here that we really need to think about? The issue here is the height of the, of the truck. If the truck were a different height, that's a form of variation. We can prove that that's the essential issue. If the truck were a different height, we would not, uh, namely uh, lower, <laughs> we wouldn't have a problem. So we've got to think about the height. And then let's think about it in terms of looking at getting specific. That's what we do in key concept thinking as we try to uh, focus more specifically, key concept thinking, let me just uh, throw this in as a, because uh, I mentioned I, I, I meant to, uh, mentioned it before, the basic principle of key concept thinking is to get more out of your thinking of any kind, refocus it more specifically on the key concepts of the situation, more specific focus on specific key concepts. So in this case, you can think about the height of the truck, but the, the, the useful thing is to think about the elements of the height, you know, what makes the height work, work from the top down. So there's a, the truck has a roof. Is there anything we can do about the roof without a sledgehammer and even with a sledgehammer? I don't think so. And then there, I don't think we want to smash the windshield. Uh, that might work, you know, if you could bend the top down from, from that, but we're not going to do that. Um, there's nothing inside the, cab that we would do um there's the there's the motor the engine of the truck is that gonna you know in, the engine block the linkages other such stuff no we're not going to do anything to that to change that that material is pretty much incompressible or unchangeable uh you come down eventually you will come down to what steve at the bottom there <laughs> at the bottom what will you come down to uh, letting the air out of the tire. Well, yeah, okay. You're getting ahead of me a little bit, right? You come down to the tires, and you, you know, you basically ask yourself, what can vary about this element of the tires? What could vary? And a big thing that could vary is the air in it. And once you figure that out, it's just thinking about what could what varies and whether that matters or not. Uh, once you do that, uh, well, that's exactly what we did. We let some air out of the tires, not a whole lot, but just enough. Um, he drove in and the rest of us drove in. We all lived happily ever after until the uh, hurricane came. And that's another story. But anyway, that's the, that's the stuck truck uh, and, how, and how to solve it. I like this because it's a real world. It's a problem that actually occurs in the real world. So some people don't like some of my examples because they're, they're uh, artificial. Well, this one's absolutely real, um, even though it so, does show up in puzzle books. Yes. So the one before that is if it has hydraulic shocks, then you would decompress. <laughs> is that what you were? Oh, I don't know. I didn't think to, you know, I, I was trying to think what I could uh, about whatever elements there are. You could have thought about, you could have thought about the shocks. I don't know if there's anything you can do with the shocks. If you, and maybe there's, maybe there would actually be a solution there, but I don't think so because would that actually, could you actually lower the height of the whole height of the thing? I think in that way, if you, uh, I, at least if there's a way of doing it, that didn't occur to me. <laughs> and the air is easy. Letting out the air is easy. Clearly easier than anything like that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, 
So be, that's easier than uh, digging a ditch where the <laughs> underneath so the height is lower. <laughs> Well, you could have tried that, I guess. Yeah, it's certainly easier than that. Um, you'd have to, the problem with that, in this case, I didn't really explain this fully. The guy drove in and he got stuck. And so he tried to put it, he tried to shift it in the reverse. Couldn't do it. It wouldn't move. So the thing was immovable, basically. Um, it was it was stuck in, in a way that would require a lot of force to push it in or out. So it would have been difficult to, to dig a, but to dig a trench under it would have uh, you'd have to tunnel basically. I guess in, in principle you could, but it would have been hard to do, much harder than what we actually did, of course. Again, it just goes to show uh, when you got a um, a good uh, variational thinker like Bob, you can uh, people can come up with other other possible uh, approaches. You know, there's always often where generally there's more than one approach to the problems of this sort. Okay, so what can vary? And what if it varies, what difference does it make? All right, I think I'm, we're, we're moving along here. Time marches on. I want to move on to what I'm going to call, uh, for one of a better phrase, but I, I should like this phrase, analogical variation. And analogical variation is where you take a problem and you vary the problem into a similar problem, vary it in some way that makes it a similar problem that is easier to solve but has either the same or at least a very similar solution. You change it in some way, you've got a little different problem, but it's one that's easier to solve. Uh, for example, a simple kind of general example is when you have problems with big numbers that have big, huge numbers, often if you translate it into a, a similar problem with small numbers, it's one of my students called this thinking in small terms. I like that uh, as a heuristic. You know, if you can change a problem, take it, with big numbers and print it into small numbers. And maybe the answer is not the same answer, but it's similar, uh, you can get a handle on it. And I, I actually can think of some examples, but I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, we have a nice one, or what I think is a nice one here from geometry. If Steve's got that, don't- Are you ready? Don't show the, I don't, <laughs> okay. <laughs> do not show the second. I will Mark. not. I will not. First. I have the correct one. I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. All right. There it is. It's a little... Uh, I used to have this in the middle, but somehow it, it migrated. But okay, it doesn't matter. Anyway, what do we have here? That is supposed to be an equilateral triangle. I, I drew that by hand. Uh, but anyway, it's supposed to be equilateral. And then there's a circle inscribed. The inscribed circle touches... through touch is tangent and on three sides. And then there's another equilateral triangle whose sides are parallel to the bigger triangle inside the circle. Okay, so that's what you have. And the question is simply, what is the ratio of the area of the big triangle to the area of the small, smaller triangle? What is the ratio? I, the, we didn't give any numbers, so you can't calculate the areas numerically exactly. And undoubtedly, you could do this problem uh, uh, with a little geometry and algebra. You know, if, if you know that triangles one half base times height, and I haven't even thought about how to do it, but I, I'm, I'm sure you can do it. But there's a very simple solution if you can think of how to analogically vary this problem into a simpler problem. And then what you do is you look around and say, well, what are the things I can uh, wiggle or, or, or rotate or change or move around without basically changing the problem. And just to cut right, I mean, you could try all kinds of stuff, I suppose, but just to cut right to it, you can take that triangle or the circle, it doesn't matter, either one, of them, and rotate that triangle, the, the one in the middle, the smaller triangle. You can rotate that in, inside there, or you can, if you wanted to, you could just rotate the circle and keep the triangle where it is. Oh, and Steve just did it. A little, you got a little ahead of me, but okay. You oh. rotate that, you rotate that and see if you can find a, a, a position by variation that is propitious for sol solution, that makes the solution easier. And if you happen to rotate it, um, how many degrees is that anyway? 180. 180, says Bob, and that is correct. It's 180 degree rotation. If you rotate 180 degrees, and you just look at it, you don't have to know anything about geometry to see that basically you have four triangles in there, all the same size. And so that middle triangle is one fourth. So the correct answer is four to one. 
bad. And this is something that, uh, amazing how many problems where analogical variation can, can uh, make, make a, a harder problem easier. So it's, it's worth keeping in mind. It's a little different usage than what I've used it for, what I was using it for before, but it's, it's based on a variation in imagination. Uh, if you have time, I guess we possibly do. I again. did. Um, I did describe this pro problem for GPT four, and it it, oh, yeah? it solved it. Did you really? But being yeah, but being I <laughs> uh, being I a uh, didn't uh, didn't work, and and yeah. Well, you say but, it solved. Yeah. It. Did it? Did it yeah, explain how it did it? Step by step, five, five steps. Yes. Uh, and and uh, were, they, were these uh, uh, algebraic steps? No, they were uh, all uh, descriptive uh, terms, not mathematical. Just okay, but I mean, did it use a different? Let me put it this way: Did it use a different process from this to solve it? You're not sure. I would have to read it again. I'd have all to right. read it again. Well, I'm glad you brought up Chat GPT because I wanted to mention that. I'm, I will. Uh, uh momentarily but let me see if we if we i think we have time to bring up the most famous creative thinking problem in history or actually i should say a variation on it which and i have done this before also but i don't think too recently um and it's a problem that well that creative variation uh, definitely applies to so here it is you're sitting in a boat a small boat in the middle of a lake. Maybe you're fishing or you know, anyway, you're just sitting there at the moment. You're sitting in this boat and you look at the bottom of your boat and you see there's a rock in the bottom of your boat. There's a rock in your boat. A little rock, not too big, a little rock. And you don't want a rock in your boat. So you pick up the rock and you throw it in the air. It twirls around, hits the water with a plop and sinks to the bottom. Okay. And that's basically all that happens here. You pick up the rock, throw it in the air, hits the water, sinks to the bottom. That's the uh, whole process that we were, that occurs. Now the question is: once the uh, transient phenomenon, you know, the ripples die down. Once the ripples die down, the question is: what if anything? What if anything happens to the level of the water on the shoreline of the lake? on the shore of the lake. That is to say, does it go up, down, or stay the same? Now, a problem with this problem, one of the things that makes this problem somewhat tricky is that given the situation I've described, if there is an effect, if that's the answer, that there is an effect, it's not gonna be a big one. It's gonna be a small effect. It's kind of hard to, you know, uh, to track it. So in that sense. So that's why the sucker answer frequently given by first year physics students. So I've been told the sucker answer is uh, stays the same. People always say, oh, no, it doesn't really make any difference. So well, that's not really right. Now, how did, how, what can you do? Well, this problem can be solved by uh, mathematics. You can apply mathematics to it. I'm not gonna do that. We're gonna use creatical variation. The problem with the problem, what makes it difficult or one thing that makes it difficult is that the effect of any is very small. So what we want to do to counteract that is make the effect big, vary, the, vary some stuff. What can we do? So let's take, for example, the, I guess the most obvious thing, what do we want to do to that lake? We want to, it's a big lake out there, you know, Lake Michigan, I don't know, whatever it was. Uh, it's a big lake, Lake Superior, that's even bigger. The Caspian Sea, it's a big lake. So what, we, what do we want to do? We want to make that leak, lake? Scale it, variation. Small. Let's make it into like a swimming pool or maybe even one of those bathtubs in the Poconos, or even, but let's say a swimming pool. Okay, so that's something like that, a big, a big swim. And so you got a boat, boat sitting in the swimming pool so that to make the effects bigger, shrink the lake. Now, the other thing that you could do, I mean, there are many things you could think of changing. Uh, it does, the boat is not so actually so important in this, but the rock, is not going to be, you know, a little rock in your boat isn't going to do much when it's thrown into the water. So what do you want to do to that rock? You can, you have a choice of things to try. You could try changing the volume or the mass, weight, let's call it weight, I guess, 
Which of those do you want to choose, Steve? Which one of those do you want to change? The weight. Let's change the well, weight because if you change the volume of the thing and make the thing a big volume, all that's going to end up doing is going to mean the rock's going to end up floating <laughs> from the water. <laughs> so that's not going to help. But if you change the uh, the weight of it, now what is that going to do? Okay, so now you have to think this through, but it doesn't really take, um, you don't really have to have studied physics to, 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 to get this, I think. So when the rock is in the uh, this really heavy, so let's make this rock out of, White, white dwarf star matter, you know, it's like two, the rock's like two tons. It's probably more than that, for it, but let's call it, let's, let's say it's a two ton rock. So it's sitting there and let's say it's not, it doesn't crash through the bottom and it doesn't sink your boat because we don't want that. But it, it really makes the boat go down a lot. Okay, so you got the rock in the boat, it goes down a lot. And the going down a lot causes the level of the water on the, on the ed, end of the pool to go up a lot or a little a lot a lot okay so now you take the uh, rock out of the boat the two-ton rock toss it in the air um it, it twirls around and let's talk about it while it's still in the air let's talk about it still in the air the boat imagine this think of imagine this the boat shoots upwards a lot and therefore the water level goes down. down down a lot a lot we're not dealing with exact numbers here but a lot it goes down a lot okay so from from the starting position i actually i didn't have to consider that first time that it went up I, that was really unnecessary our starting position was the rock was in the boat so it was already high now we throw this in the air it goes down a lot that's the key thing it goes down a lot from the starting position and then now you have to think about what happens when it hits the water, when the rock hits the water. Will the, what will happen to the water level of the, on the shore? When a rock hits the water, what will happen to the level of the water on the shore? It will go up. It'll go up. But here's the key question here. A lot or a little? A lot. Well, now you might want to think about this for a while if you think it's a lot. Imagine this. Let's do some other. Let's do a simpler um, thought experiment. You got a glass of water at, at home, and you take a rock, now fill up the glass part way. Okay, take the rock and toss it in, and um, okay, and it goes up. Right, the water level goes up. Now imagine after you've done that, imagine making the rock heavier and heavier, but not changing its volume or anything, its shape or volume. Just keep the rock at the same size, but imagine making it heavier and heavier. Would that change anything about the water going up or not? No, it doesn't. It doesn't make any difference because the point is, and if you think about this, imagine it, you will see that the amount of water displaced by the rock when it goes underwater is, is the equivalent to its volume. Thank you, Archimedes. Not, yeah, this is Archimedes' principle. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's bad when you have these smart guys. I should get... Get rid of you smart guys and get some dumber guys in here. All right. Anyway, so uh, thanks, Bob. <laughs> right. This argument. So um, where was I going with? Oh, so if you think about that and realize that the mass of the uh, rock really, when it's submerged, doesn't matter at all. And you can make it two tons or a mi hundred million tons, and it won't make any difference uh, as far as the, uh, the level of water going up in the lake. So that what that means is. When you uh, let me recap, when uh, when you throw the a rock out of the boat, the boat shoots up. The level of the water goes down a lot in this pool. See, it goes down a lot. The rock hits the uh, lake, and that will eventually, after the ripples die down, and the level of the water will go up a little. And therefore, at the end, the net result is it goes down. That's the net result. And that is the correct answer. And you can obtain, the, anybody can, pretty much anybody can obtain this, I think. Well, anybody that's had a little experience, it doesn't require uh, knowledge. You don't really need to know uh, the mathematics of Archimedes' principle. Now, Archimedes, this is a very famous problem. I guess I can tell this uh, really there quickly in history, because Archimedes, uh, this is a legend. Who knows how much of this is true? 
the the um, <laughs> the tyrant of Syracuse, which is where Archimedes lived, not the one in New York, but the other Syracuse, you know, on the Mediterranean. So that uh, Archimedes was the court engineer for the tyrant of Syracuse, and the tyrant had the king, uh, called the king, had a crown made. And he wanted to know, the crown was supposed to be pure gold. He wanted to know if it was pure gold. He thought it maybe was adulterated with silver or lead or something. So he wanted to know if it was pure gold. And he said, Archie, uh, I want you to tell me if this is pure gold, but I don't want you pouring any, any of your acids on it or doing chemical tests. I just want you to tell me if the crown is pure gold or not. And the Ar Archimedes said, well, how, how do you expect me to do that if I can't do any chemical tests? And the king said, well, that's your problem. So Archimedes went home, according to the legend, Thought and thought and thought. He went home, the greatest mathematician of antiquity um, and engineer of antiquity. And he thought about it and he couldn't solve it. So he said, the hell with it, went to the public bath in the center of Syracuse. And so the story goes, as he stepped into the bath, the bath overflowed, <laughs> the water overflowed. And he shouted, Eureka! Eureka! <laughs> he shouted, Eureka! which is a really, you know, high level of insight. Uh, it's like uh, the aha, but the one that only comes every thousand years or so. So he shouted Eureka, and the story says he ran naked through the streets of, of Syracuse, shouted Eureka, and he went home, and, uh, and then he, he uh, took the, I guess he had the crown. He went back to the king and said, King, loan me an equivalent weight of gold to this crown. And so the king gave him that, and so he went, and he got a, a beaker of water, they, they weighed it out, you know, an equal amount of gold to the crown. And he got a, a beaker of water, uh, Mark, let's say, I don't know how he did it, but he marks it halfway and puts some water in it, submerges the crown, and it goes up a certain amount. Then he took the crown out and made, shook it and made sure all the water went back into the, into the beaker, took that equivalent weight of gold and submerged it, and it didn't go up. Oh, it actually, it went up further. Yeah, it went up further. The, the, the weight of gold went, uh, caused, a, it wasn't the same. It went up further, and uh, he realized it was adulterated with a less dense metal. So he went back and explained that to the king who um, executed, uh, you know, beheaded the crown maker, and everybody lived happily ever after in that situation until the Romans came. It's another story, you know, the Romans, uh, uh, the barbaric Romans killed Archimedes, it turns out, later. Okay, so uh, that's, the, that's a variation, actually, actually a harder variation on the most famous problem in creative thinking history, and it's solvable like so many by using creatical uh, variation. Now, I wanted to mention a couple of other things quickly. We, I guess we've reached the end here, so there, uh, I'm not, no, no, not much else I can do, but I do want to mention that there are other thought experiments to think about um, that are worth thinking about and that we might discuss at the clubhouse coming up. And one of them is, is uh, well, there's one, one thought experiment. Philosophers have these thought experiments, have various of them. One is the zombie thought experiment. And the zombie thought experiment is you imagine a, a, a creature, it's like a human in all respects, except that it's not conscious, it has no consciousness. And according to the thought experiment, the people that promote it, um, this creature would behave just like a human being, would be indistinguishable in behavior from a human being. And that shows um, uh, that, conscious among other things, it shows that consciousness is inessential if you, if you buy this thought experiment. But this is not a very good thought experiment. They're not really thinking carefully about, you have to, if you're gonna do a thought experiment like this, you have to think carefully in detail about the implications. And basically all this kind of thought experiment tells you, well, maybe all the thought experiments for that matter, all they really tell you is they make explicit your own beliefs that are maybe implicit. So when a materialist does this thought experiment, the zombie who doesn't think consciousness either doesn't believe in it or doesn't think it matters, he comes up with the idea, you know, that okay, you could have a zombie that would behave just like a human being. But of course that's not the case. Um, another thought experiment is the famous John Searle Chinese room thought experiment. And I, I, I think we'll, I'm gonna not, exp most of you out there probably have heard of this thing, maybe know what it is. I'm just gonna say this much. 
this thought experiment is actually relevant to something hot in the news these days, namely chat GPT in any of its many um, incarnations. What is it up to now, Steve? Is it past four now? I don't know what it's up to. But anyway, whatever no. incarnation, incarnation, incarnation that it's in, whatever this exp- uh, idea uh, applies to it, you know, the thought experiment of imagining a, a guy um, in a room and his little squiggles come in from one side and he's got a big book and he looks up stuff and, in, and he puts output squiggles on the other side. And uh, this is a, this is, this, the room is supposed to perform translation, Chinese, uh, or not translation, discussion in Chinese. That's the idea. And the point is that if it's done in this algorithmic fashion, um, there's no, there's no, um, let me see if I can put this right. It, it, the, the operation, that kind of operation doesn't have, and have consciousness involved. There's no understanding involved. And that, I think that chat GPT is a very close to an implementation of John Searle's thought experiment. I'm explaining this very uh, briefly, uh, not, not adequately, but we can talk about it more in Clubhouse. Um, that chat GPT is an example, very close to being an example of what Searle was talking about in his thought experiment. And I think people's reactions to chat GPT are similar, would be similar to their reaction to the thought experiment. I think the thought experiment is good in showing that just because you have something that has a certain kind of behavior uh, doesn't mean that it's conscious. I don't think chat GPT is conscious. I don't think it knows anything. I don't think it's intelligent. It's remarkable, it's amazing. It may have tremendous social and, and uh, economic implications, but it ain't conscious and it isn't an example of intelligence. So we'll, anyway, anyone who wants to, we might discuss that further. Bob, you have anything you want to throw in before we run off to? No, save it Clubhouse? for Clubhouse. Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's go over to Clubhouse. We can talk about that or anything else if anybody wants. Okay, we and, have a, a super chat. Oh, well, let's, okay, let's, let's do that. There. Yeah, Kathleen sent us a, a super chat, and she said, Great. "Enjoying, enjoying this very much. Thank you, thank you, Ka- Kathleen, for for attending." Well, thanks, and thanks everybody else for being on the cutting edge no, today. No, we'll for no uh, questions there out there though. No, just a comment. Okay. Oh, we got we we just got a new one. Gail Parker, no yes. com- comment here, but she she gave she gave. A super chat, five bucks, and Kathleen gave two pounds. Great. So All we right. got two super chats. Different Thank currencies. you for the ladies today. They're yeah. very kind to us. Thanks. And we'll see you over at Clubhouse. Very good. Bye. Thanks.